Hi, I'm Father Louis Gertie, and I welcome you to Friends of the Word. We meet each week to evangelize through God's Holy Word, the Scriptures. Today is the 17th Sunday of the year, and I'm here at the beautiful church of Espiritu Santo in Florida. If you like what you hear, pass it on to your family and friends. If you'd like to contact me, it's lskurdy at hotmail.com. God bless you. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. <clears throat> Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone in debt to us. And do not subject us to the final test. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend to whom he goes at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived in my house from a journey, and I have nothing to offer him. And he says in reply from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get, get up to give you anything. I tell you, if he does not get up to give the visit of the loaves because of their friendship, he will get up to give him whatever he needs because of his persistence. And I tell you, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What parent among you would hand your child a snake when he asks for a fish? Or hand him a scorpion when he asks for an egg? If you then, who are wicked, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, first of all, we've got to look at the Old Testament as the Old Testament. There's a few things going on in here that um, we got to get rid of. Okay, first of all, but before that, have you ever been to the Middle East? Have you ever been to Asia, into bazaars, marketplaces? Raise your hand and say yes or no. Okay, some of you have. Okay, well, let me tell you what happens there. If, if, if you're in a, if you're in a, a bazaar in, in Asia, Middle East, China, it's happened in some other countries, uh, North Africa, and you want to buy a particular item, Typically, the haggling has to happen. You don't go in and say, oh, this thing is marked uh, 10 bucks, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. No, 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 no. It, it's marked some phenomenal number, whatever it is. It could be a, a paintbrush, it could be a piece of art, it could be anything. And whatever it's named or priced, you, you pick it up and the owner will say to you, how much do you want to spend for that? And, you know, my gut, the first time it happened to me, it's, like, nothing, you know, I want to earn this much, you know. Tell me how much you want to spend. Well, you know, you say, okay, uh, say it's marked 50 bucks. Uh, um, I was 20. Oh, I, you can't do 20? I'm, I've got to feed my children, you know. No, you got, come on. How about 45? Right, and then, then you, gotta, you, get the, you get the guts. And you, you go, no, no, not 45. How about 25? No, I've got to feed my children. How can I pay my bills, my electricity? And you, can, you, you haggle back and forth until you get at a price that you're willing to pay and he or she is willing to accept. That haggling is very, very common in the Middle East. Now, today you heard that in the Old Testament reading between God and Abraham in the book of Genesis. Now, the book of Genesis is written several different ways, and there are several different authors, and they've been overlapped. When they finally got put together in writing, the book of Genesis, all the oral traditions came together, and they were overlapped. 
the author of this section is some, sometimes called the Yaoist author. Uh, he makes God very human. I mean, you, you heard what happens. He, he looks, God looks down and says, oh, I've got to go down there because Sodom and Gomorrah are, are, are misbehaving. I'm, I'm going down there to take care of them. Now, think, I mean, you know, please. This is God, the invisible one, the creator. And he charges Abraham. He says, Abraham, I'm going to rule out and destroy all the bad people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the haggling begins. Oh, God, please don't. If, if, you, if, if there are 50 good people, would you not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay, find me 50 good people. Well, wait, wait a minute. How about, how about 40? And you heard this. How about 40? If I find 40, would you, would you not destroy? Okay, find me 40. It's God and Abraham going back and forth. 30, 20, and then finally we settle on 10. And God says, okay, if you can find 10 good people, oy vey, I won't destroy the temple. I won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, one is being revealed, the familiarity that the author is trying to impress in us, the familiarity that he, the, 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 the patriarch, Abraham, had with God. No one was there at that time taking notes. There was no, there was no stenographers, there was no Twitter, there's no like on-the-job on the reporting. So this was passed down through the generations of Jewish people, through the Israelite community, orally, and then eventually put into writing. But the themes, the underlying motives, the, the orientation is very important. The familiarity that Abram has with God. That he's a buddy with God. That he can negotiate with God. That it, it's almost like God is his equal. That's a message. What they settle on is also very important. They settle on ten. If you find ten good people, I won't destroy the place. Ten, ten is the commandments, ten is the minion. The minion is, is the minimum number of people in a temple gab needed to pray. Ten people is a minion. <clears throat> if you don't have a minion, you can't say the prayers of the day. So that's why ten is very significant here. So when, when God and Abraham are talking, they're not talking about Sodom and Gomorrah only. They're, they're talking future orientation, they're talking theology, they're talking... Uh, messages that you and I in the 21st century will still try to understand and, and, and integrate into our lives. So the familiarity going on. The other thing I want to move away from is this is an Old Testament reading. Old Testament. Pre-Christian Testament. God doesn't act this way anymore. This was the theory and theology of the Old Testament. The vengeful God looking down and say, I'm going to get you and wipe you out. That's not our God. The letter to the Colossians tell us that Jesus scooped up the relationship, the former relationship we had with God, and nailed it onto the cross with him as a debt. So the Old Testament was fulfilled in Jesus' New Testament, new law of love. So the God that we have is not a revengeful God. Not a 9-11 God. Oh, that was done to New York because there were bad people. That was done to the Pentagon because the government was there. That's garbage. That's not our God. That was evil that did that. And God doesn't give us punishments today in, in, in Katrina or, or Sandy or any other earthquake or hurricane. That's not God's work. That's nature. Those things of nature. God's not getting even. That, that Old Testament idea of the vengeful God has been put to rest and nailed to the cross through Jesus. So our focus is Jesus. So now, Jesus has his own followers, we hear, and they're impressed. This is the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of prayer. Very often, sections of the Gospel of Luke are focused on women and their role, and also prayer. Prayer is very significant in the, in the Gospel of Luke. So it's no accident that Jesus is in prayer when his disciples come to him and say, teach, teach us to do that. Come on, come on, come on. You, you have a kind of contact with the, the Creator, Yahweh. Teach us how to do that. Remember John the Baptist? He lost his head, but he, he taught his disciples how to pray. Teach us how to pray. What were they looking for? They were looking for it in. Again, a different kind of understanding of what God is all about. God is not a bargain. 
God is not the, the, a CEO of heaven. And if you get on his good side, he'll be good to you. God is your daddy. God is your Abba. That's what Jesus is trying to say to us today. So, he says, when you, when you pray, when you pray, acknowledge what you're doing. You're speaking to the Creator. You're speaking to He or She. There's no g- gender with God, but He uses Abba. He uses the male, the relationship that He has with, with the Father. I want you to speak to him, but I want you to acknowledge what you're doing. You're coming before the hallowed one. You're coming before the creator of the universe and acknowledge that. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. I, as a prayer, am acknowledging the creator. I an element of creation is acknowledging the power and presence of the Creator. So we have that relationship very clearly established. He's not my buddy, he's the hallowed one, but through Jesus, he becomes so accessible to us. And Jesus wants us to relate to him, the Creator, just like he does to his Father in heaven. And then he lists, and this is, and prayer is so important in our lives as Christians. <clears throat> yes, the, the prayers that you read in the missals and the books, they're all very important. Go back to when you were a child in grammar school, and the teacher said, it's Father's Day coming up, I want you all to make a little card for daddy, for your daddies. Think about the kinds of stuff you would have put into that card. Maybe symbols that represent him. My father was a cigar smoker, so maybe I'd put a cigar label or, or him smoking a cigar. Or, or if your father wore a hat, maybe that would be in the picture. Or a tie, maybe that would be in the picture. You, you, were, you were getting a message across to your daddy about what you knew of him, but also the fact that he was your father and you were his child. And you want to you want to enjoy that relationship. You, you want to let that relationship flower on Father's Day. So as you put your glitter and your glue and your crayons and your symbols together to make this card, you're sending a communication. And that's what Jesus is encouraging us to do today. To send the communication to your Father. Now, our Father is the Creator. So we've got a few things going on here. But he wants to relate to us as Jesus relates to him, father to son, intimate relationship, while we acknowledge that it depends on him. And yes, we can use all the words we know. We can use the Lord's Prayer, which we have today in the scripture, Luke's version, different from Matthew's version, as you you heard. We can use the Hail Marys. You can use the the Novenas. Very, very important. But don't let any of those words get in the way of you and your father's relationship. Don't let any of the words... It's not a hallmark or it's not a a, a card from from a candy store. No, make your own card up. And don't let somebody else's words get before you and your father. You want to say the formal words? Knock your socks off. But realize that the formal words are only one level of relationship. Jesus wants us to relate to the the Father as his daddy. Abba. I mean, just think what a father does to a child positively. The warm, the relationship. What I I think of, for, for me, my father is when we used to go to feasts in Holy Rosary in Jersey City. That's where I'm from. And we would go to the feast on Sunday night and they would have fireworks and I couldn't see the fireworks because, you know, I'm a little bit... He would put me on his shoulder. Loved it. Loved that. Just being on his shoulder. And, and I, was, I, was, I was always a little nasty. Uh, I would go, bang, 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 <laughs> on his head. That's why he started wearing a hat, I think. <laughs> okay, so, 
But, but that's the kind of relationship God the Father wants with you and me. He wants us to be so comfortable with him that we can bang on his head or, or tickle him or, or, or pull his beard because he's our creator. We know that. But because of Jesus, he became our daddy. Our Lord is our daddy. And he wants us to speak to him from our hearts. And, we, we, and, and in Luke's gospel, he, he makes sure we hit that. We'll, we'll get that toward the end. <clears throat> and then he says, be realistic when you're speaking to the Father. Give us this day our daily bread. Pana to eat? Not so much. G- give, me, give me definition and give me meaning to my life. Let me understand that wh- whatever role I play in the family, husband, wife, child, grandparent, next door neighbor, whatever role I play has significance. And he, he wants us to get that point across as he tells us, appreciate your daily bread. Let me realize that, that life, faith, everything around me is my daily bread. And I could be nourished on that if I see it and appreciate it, but if I don't see it and don't appreciate it, it goes to waste. How many of us have so many gifts in our friends, in our families, in our relationships that we ignore, we take advantage of, we we use terrible words toward? Give us this day our daily bread and let that bread be the significance of life. Yeah, it'd be nice to eat too, but significance of life. Without your health, it doesn't matter how much of bread you have. And Jesus is encouraging us to maintain our spiritual health. We call that in the church, in a a history of theology, grace. Let's just keep it there as spiritual health. But we're asking God to increase every day my spiritual health by giving me our daily bread and be realistic I want to be forgiven because, listen, I'm coming before you because I'm the creature, you're the creator, and I know I've screwed up a lot. I I, I misspoken to my wife, my child, my parent, my next-door neighbor. I've stolen, I've I've touched somebody's character. Maybe I've I've made accusations. Maybe I was unfaithful. Ah, get it all out. Because you want to be totally honest, and you know what? If you don't be honest, he sees you anyway. So we've got to be totally honest. And we've got to work toward that change, that metanoia. The things that bug us, the things that put us at distance from God, they have to be changed. That's why we say, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us, but don't you dare ask God to forgive you unless you forgive others. This is Jesus saying, not me. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone in debt to us. Very important. And again, that's different than than Matthew's gospel. This gospel rendition of the Lord's Prayer is probably older than Matthew's. Matthew's gospel became uh, used in in the church services. That's why we know that one better. And it's translations. It's translations and and theology. Matthew's theology is a little different than than Luke's theology. But this, this is Luke's gospel encouraging us to have such an intimate relationship with God And self-knowledge, to really know yourself, to really say, I go to church because my goal is to bring church out there. I go to church to receive the Eucharist. I go to church to hear the Word of God because my goal as a follower of Christ is to bring the Eucharist to others, not only as extraordinary ministers, but as ministers of the body of Christ. So if I'm holier than thou in church and I, I curse and, and, and profane and, and take advantage of people outside and abuse people outside, it's garbage. Because God sees you. You can pray until the cows come home. You leave here and you're a hypocrite. You're going to hell, folks. That's it. No, no two ways about it. That's not me. It's Jesus. Don't blame me, you know. Don't blame the messenger. Just the message. That's it. So Jesus wants us to acknowledge our wrongs, our debts, and forgive others. And that's an ongoing canzone. It's an ongoing song. Someone said, don't use Italian unless you translate it. So it's an ongoing canzone. It's an ongoing song. 
I forgive, I understand. And you know, sometimes you can't, you can forgive somebody, but it doesn't work, it doesn't feel right inside. Well then, Pokemon Boni, a little bit at a time, okay? So when someone hurts you, someone's uh, insulted you, forgive and then work on the forgiveness when you go home. Because if you don't forgive, it eats away inside of you. Oh, sure, they cut you off or they said something nasty to you or they didn't take you where you wanted to go and you're cursing them and angry at them and, and they don't have any care. They have no idea. And you're carrying the anxiety inside. That's why we speak to the Father. Okay, Father, I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to forgive that person to the best of my relationship. And then I want to look at how you accept me and forgive me and want me one with you. And, of course, as any of us, we, we ask Jesus, through the words of Jesus, the Father, to <clears throat> keep us away from the final test. Maunya Jordan is a test. Every day is a test. Keep us away from the test. Who's the test? You know what? The devil's the test. Satan's the test. Keep us away from temptation. That's what Matthew uses. Keep us away from going my way and not your way. Keep us away from being selfish and self-centered. Keep us away from getting revengeful remarks. Keep us away from prejudice. Keep us away from injustice. Because when I hear injustice and prejudice, I should go toward it to change it. Because if I don't fight for my brothers and sisters, oh, brothers and sisters, where'd that come from? Our Father. So that means brothers and sisters in the community, in the world. So when there's injustice and there's domestic violence and, and there's abuse, and I don't do my best to change that, to work for change, God doesn't hear you. It's going in one ear and out the other. But if we come before God honestly, Hop up on my lap, he says, as the daddy would say. Hop on my lap. And, and how does Jesus illustrate all of this in the, at, at the end of the, uh, this section of the gospel? In, in his day, people had urns to keep certain items fresh. And he names what the items are. Eggs and fish. They would stay in pottery urns in the dark and stay cool that, so they can use them. But, you know what? Snakes are very wise. And scorpions, even better yet. Or worse yet. So they would sneak into these bowls, these urns, to eat the egg or eat the fish. So you've got to be very careful when you take the top of the urn off to look what's in there. And what he's saying to us, if, if your child asks you for an egg, you don't reach in and just hand them what's there. You might be a scorpion. Or it might be a snake. Charity, respect, equality, justice. That's what he's talking about. God will take care of you. God will feed you, us. God will take care of us, feed us, nourish us. But we've got to be careful to feed and nourish and love others as he loves us. Jesus teaches to pray. And he ends up with the most beautiful part of it. How much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to all of us who ask? And that's it. That's the punctuation. The Holy Spirit. You can't see the Spirit. You can experience the Spirit. Some people feel the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit gives us the grace, the health to focus our prayers to the Father in imitation of Jesus, his son, our brother. The Holy Spirit, God's kiss to us, the Father's embrace, the Holy Spirit will be given to us to the measure and degree that we heal and reach out to others as we pray to our Daddy in heaven. Thank <clears throat> you.